Michael here is going to present on testing JavaScript and the front end and uh, how to do it in a way that you're not going to hate. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, today I'm going to give a talk about testing JavaScript. Uh, we're going to cover some basic tools and ways that we can test our JavaScript applications. But the main driver behind this talk is building JavaScript applications that we won't hate. I know there's a bit of a not super good relationship uh, with JavaScript with a lot of people in this room, probably. Um, but once you start to embrace it and, and use it, I find it's really nice to work with to build really powerful front ends. Um, so this is a tweet I really like. Uh, it's a classic JavaScript meme about, <laughs> about this. Um, but the first half of this tweet, <coughs> first half of this tweet definitely resonated with me for a lot of years. Um, and I've worked with a lot of full stack PHP devs. And you can always tell when they're touching JavaScript because swearing is just coming from everywhere. And you, I've heard this literally muttered a lot of times in the office. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, like, is JavaScript a really bad language, or do we just not have the tools and experience to write it? Um, JavaScript's terrible. <laughs> just kidding. Um, JavaScript, modern JavaScript is actually really nice. Um, when I first started building JavaScript applications, they did tend to kind of degrade into this dumpster fire over time. It's more complexly added, and, and things change a lot. But the more I've worked with it, the more I've learned to love it and, and find that it's actually not that bad. And the reality is, uh, these days, if you want to like, maximize your earning potential in the market and work on exciting projects, like, you have to know how to write JavaScript as a full stack developer. If you want to stay in the back end, probably smarter than <laughs> some of us doing the full stack. But um, yeah, learning how to write good JavaScript is, is really valuable. Uh, so why do we test? It's pretty straightforward. I'm sure everyone knows and has opinions here, so we're not going to go over it too much. But I just want to set some context uh, so we can keep it in mind as we go through all the tools I'm going to talk about. Obvious one is correctness. Uh, pretty much anyone would give you that answer if you ask them why we test. Um, refactoring comes off the back of correctness, so being able to make changes to our code, rerun the test suite, make sure everything still works is, is really useful, especially in the front end where things change all the time. And then scale is kind of the thing that follows on from that. Uh, the obvious thing of scale is your app complexity, like new features and things like that. But I think the one that kind of gets forgotten a lot uh, is that scaling the number of developers on a team is also a, a real challenge. Um, I've worked for a lot of early stage startups and scale ups where they've gone from one or two developers to six to eight developers. And if you have good test coverage, uh, it acts as like really good documentation and means people can come into the team straight away on day one, make changes, push it, and if the test passes, they can have confidence that they're not going to break something in their first week. Uh, so, really, all three of these, in my opinion, can be summed up around improving the developer experience. So, I write tests for myself, not because of some like fundamental philosophy that if you don't write tests, your software is not good. Uh, it makes my life easier, and that's why I write them, and that's why I try and learn how to write tests that are going to make my life easier. Um, so if you've ever worked somewhere that had low test coverage, uh, not great deployment processes, uh, you probably understand the, the difference if, if you've then built that up to a really robust testing pipeline. Uh, it makes a world of difference, and, and you stop hating work. Um, <coughs> so what do we test? This is like massive opinion territory, and it's been covered to death. People write books and give talks about this all the time, so we're just going to skim through it and then get stuck into the good stuff. Uh, so I really love this tweet. Um, basically, the testing Dorito, they flipped the testing pyramid over its head and said, we've got the tests I plan to write, the tests I start writing, the tests I delete because they're stupid and take more effort than they're worth, and then you kind of get left with whatever tests fall off at the bottom. Um, and I love this because it really highlights the cost of tests. As uh, someone mentioned before that they don't like testing the front end because it changes so much. Um, and so we have to think about our tests a little bit differently and how we do them. Uh, so on the topic of opinions, Yuliamo here, he's a creator of Zyat, a couple of open source projects like Socket.io and Mongoose. He says, write tests, not too many, mostly integration. Some of you probably feel this way. Here's another one I really like. Integration tests are a scam. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're trying to figure out how to test as a developer and you come across these two things, um, welcome to software. <laughs> Uh, so I really like this talk. There's a good talk on this. Uh, the argument's a little bit circular. Uh, but yeah, definitely Google this if you haven't seen this, um, especially if you don't agree with it or do agree with it. But uh, I'm going to talk about all the tools that I've used and the, the areas I use them. So you can make up your own mind if they're going to be useful to you. Um, so we have a few things in our testing talk here. I'm going to go over them pretty quickly at a high level. I'm not going to go too deep into the code, because this is a terrible 
terrible medium for like teaching you how to write code, and the documentation of all the tools that I'm going to talk about is really great. So just go over at a high level, and then you can go uh, read the docs and, and go from there if you want to start integrating them. So the first thing in my testing toolkit is static analysis. Some people wouldn't classify this as testing, but I'm really glad we saw in the last talk that um, it's very useful. So things like ESLint and TypeScript, you don't even have to write tests, and your IDE will tell you you've made a mistake, especially if you're using types. Um, and I find that really useful. It's basically zero effort, and you get <coughs> a lot of stuff for free. Um, so ESLint is more than just linting and formatting. It does things like tell you if you're missing imports, you've got unused variables, unreachable statements, um, functions that don't do anything. So <coughs> you get a lot of stuff for free uh, when you use ESLint. And TypeScript as well, we saw, <coughs> offers a lot of things. Um, and I really like this because it's low effort, high return, um, and it just makes the kind of cognitive overhead of reading code all day. Um, a lot less when everything's kind of written in the same way. Um, <coughs> so on types, some people feel like this, and sometimes they host Laracon, um, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a really good talk on this by Gary Bernhardt from Destroy All Software. Um, definitely check it out if you're interested in the whole type versus no type, uh, which is kind of like a tabs versus spaces debate, in my opinion. Um, tests are examples. Correctness is hard to prove from examples. And we know this is true because we have a word for this, and that's edge case. If, t if tests had perfect examples, we would never have edge cases. And so it's really hard in the infinite realm of anything that could possibly happen to our code to write a test to cover all of that. Um, types, on the other hand, are categories. And categories can't prove correctness either. But what they can do is they can like, bound the world uh, that we need to write examples for. And they also give us some nice compile time checks. Um, and on the fly checking in our IDEs when we write stuff. Um, and if you're comfortable with types and really used to them, they're actually a really good form of documentation. And in my opinion, reading type code is easier for me to read. Um, but if you don't like types, don't have to use them. You can write perfectly good apps without them, but they're there if, if you want them. Uh, the only thing I will say, though, is if you're using Vue on the front end, which a lot of us are, TypeScript support isn't fully there yet. And you'll have to do a bit of tweaking and Googling and swearing um, to get that all working properly. But Vue 3, fingers crossed, should be really good. Uh, so now we get into unit testing. Uh, I really love unit tests. They're really fast. They encourage pure functions. But they have no side effects. Um, and I use Jest for this. Jest is a really good testing library. There's a few other options, but Jest is just the one I've always used, and I've never felt the need to reach for anything else. Really well documented. Um, so that's what I use for unit testing. Jest also does integration testing. It uh, has really good support for Vue and React. Uh, you can hook into like Vue and React libraries themselves and do things like hook into mounted hooks, um, do like shallow or deep renders of components, assert things happen in the actual framework. So it's, it's really powerful for that. Um, but honestly, these days, I don't actually write too many of these on the front end. Um, and that's because I structure my code in a way that tries to maximize the isolation between my components. So a lot of my early apps would pass around a lot of props. And a component might not need a prop, but it needs to pass it down to something else. You'd have an event bus. Um, and state management was kind of the hardest thing about building JavaScript applications early. Uh, so Vuex and Redux, while they're not testing, um, state management tool, I find, just really simplifies your app a lot. Um, and you basically push all the side effects into one spot. And your components are basically just have rendering logic, and display logic, and all, all your really complex stuff lives in the store. Um, and that just reduces the number of code paths that you have to test, because every component just reaches into the store and listens for changes and updates accordingly. So you don't have to test component interactions anymore. A lot of the time, uh, you can just test each component in isolation against the store. You have, still have um, components that pass around props, um, but I find you get a lot less when you're using state management. Uh, so Jest has another kind of test that I don't really use, but it's there, so I'll go over it quickly. That is snapshot testing. Um, basically, just takes a snapshot of your code output dumps it into a folder, and then every time you run it, it makes sure nothing's changed. So by definition, you can't use it for TDD because you have to have something there to snapshot. A lot of the time, people don't validate the snapshot, so it's useless. They're just asserting that it's still broken every time they run it. Um, <laughs> and because it outputs into your code directory, if you've got a large team working on similar components, you get a lot of merge conflicts in your snapshots, and that can be a pain to resolve. Um, so maybe like snapshot testing is OK and I'm wrong, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I'm sure there are use cases for it. Like, if you have no code coverage, it's really fast and easy to get code coverage because you just take a snapshot of everything and you have 100% code coverage. Um, so this could be useful in some, some cases. So 
if you think it's going to be useful to you, I'll just say like treat your snapshot artifacts like code, put them through a code review process, make sure they're being checked, um, and try and keep the snapshot small. So there's an ESLint rule for that as well to um, limit the size of your snapshots. All right, so let's write a test in Jest. So this is some TypeScript. We're going to define some simple types for this really simple example. We're just going to add an item to a shopping cart and write a test for it. Um, so this is what the type definitions look like. It's pretty straightforward. We have an item, a card item, which is just an item with a quantity, and then we have a cart, which is just an array of card items. Uh, can we read that? Yep. So we've defined this function, add item to cart. It takes an item and a cart, and we filter over the cart and check all the items in it and see if this item is already in there. And then if it is in there, we just increment the quantity by one. Otherwise, we push it in there and give it a quantity of one. And JavaScript, obviously, passing by reference, we don't actually need to return anything or do anything here. This will just mutate that object for us. Um, <coughs> so this is what a jest test looks like. This is a really kind of silly test, but um, this is what the syntax looks like. Adding an item to an empty cart makes the cart length equal to one. So we just new up an empty cart, new up an item, call that method, and we're just going to do an assertion uh, on the cart and expect it to have length one. So jest has some really nice assertion helpers to do Things like array contains or object contains keys or values, um, have length equals, all that good stuff. Um, so I use uh, WebStorm for writing JavaScript, um, and that has a really nice integration with Jest. You can basically just run it from, from your IDE, um, individual tests if you want to. And then it also gives you uh, some really nice code coverage integrations. So you can actually see here the exact lines that were executed when that test ran. Um, so we see here, uh, it basically didn't get a matched item, so it pushed it to the cart. Um, and this is really helpful for debugging uh, if you're trying to test something pretty complex. Uh, so here we've got another test where we basically test the other code path. We're just going to put an item in the cart, um, then call that function and make sure uh, that we've got two of that item in the cart now. And again, we'll check the code coverage. And we saw that we executed the other code path. So Jest is really handy, um, integrates really well. It's nice and fast, and you can do a lot with it. The next thing I use for um, JavaScript testing is uh, mutation testing, and I use Striker for that. And it basically randomly mutates your code and reruns your test suite um, to check if your tests still pass. Because if you're randomly changing code in your code base and your test suite is still passing, it's probably not a good sign. So <laughs> it basically tests the quality of your tests rather than the quality of your code. Um, and most code bases, to be honest, if you pull this in, you'll find a lot of things that will still pass. Um, and that's kind of natural, because it's really hard to catch all of these things writing tests, and that's why these tools exist. Um, so these tests are kind of slow, so I only run them on unit tests, and I don't put them in pipeline, but we'll see what this looks like. Um, so you basically just call strike a run on your code base. It runs all your tests first, because it's not going to mutate anything if your test suite doesn't pass. Um, and then it's going to tell you where you've done something stupid. So here we see my tests were kind of bad. I uh, will start with this second example. Uh, our filter function, trying to check for a match, if it just always returns true. Um, so if we do an incorrect um, check in there and it just always returns true, our test suite's still going to pass, and it's not going to catch that issue. Um, so we should go fix that. And so I've just written another test to squash that. And I basically say uh, we're going to now put two items in that cart in our test, and we're going to increment the second one and write a test for that. And now if that filter always returns true, um, the test suite will fail, and we've, we've killed that mutant. So we rerun it, and hopefully that second, second one will disappear. Cool, so now we've just got this first one here. It's basically just an object literal error. Um, so our push function, because we just did a really crappy test on asserting the length of the array was one, we could push whatever we want in there and that test would still pass. So we're just going to fix up this test a little bit here um, and do a proper assertion. So you can see this is really useful um, for just giving a health check on your test suite to make sure that, because we technically had 100% code coverage here, but we can see how we could have come unstuck uh, refactoring. So just rewrite that, rerun it. Um, show you what it looks like if you're... So if you get this error when you're running Striker, it means your test suite failed, so it didn't bother mutating anything. And that's because uh, we asserted the cart was an object, not an array. Uh, so we go fix that, rerun it. Um, and it should hopefully be good. Uh, so as I said, I don't put these in pipeline. I just kind of run these locally from time to time just as a health check on the test suite. Uh, it's unreasonable to think that you'll always kill every mutant in, in every case. 
So you kind of have to make a judgment call on which ones survive and, and which ones you address. Uh, but it's a really handy tool for just making sure you have a robust test suite. End-to-end -end testing uh, is the next tool. I use Cypress for this. Cypress is amazing. If you've ever used something like Selenium to write browser tests, you probably hate browser testing, um, which is fair. But Cypress is, is a really good tool. End-to-end -end tests I actually don't write too many of. Um, they have a reputation for being like slow to write and slow to run. I don't really find them that slow to write with Cypress. I find it takes basically the same amount of time as running a couple of unit tests. Uh, the reason I don't write many is because they're brittle and the front end changes a lot. And having to maintain all these end-to-end -end tests when you know marketing wants to split test something or add some promotion here, um, it just becomes a pain in the ass to, to maintain these tests. So I only write end-to-end -end tests for the really core workflows of the app. So the things that would make you worried for your job if they broke, or the things that are core to the business, like if you're selling something, make sure your application form works, or your quote generator tool works, or that you can you know, go through a checkout process successfully. And all the kind of edge features that support that, I don't usually write these for. I just want to make sure the core, core business logic works. Um, so this is what Cypress looks like. It gives you a nice kind of UI that runs through clicking on the test. This is just a small app I built uh, to highlight this. Um, it's for a client. They just basically e-commerce store. Uh, they have a warehouse, and they just scan the items and ship them out. So a uh, couple of lines of JavaScript to write this test. Runs pretty fast. Um, you get that nice, nice video output of what's happening. You can save these recordings and, and watch them. Um, and it, it's actually a really nice tool. But again, I find them a little bit, little bit brittle. So only write them for the important stuff. Um, and the last thing is contract testing, which is something that I've started doing fairly recently as I've kind of got deeper into this separate front end API. Um, and this basically just tests that your API and front end can still talk to each other. So if you're not using inertia or something like that, uh, you kind of have a point of failure that you don't control if you have a separate front-end and back-end team, and that's your API. And if it's a private API, you don't really want to limit your back-end team to have to version and deprecate everything. You want them to be able to make changes so long as they don't affect you. That's what contract testing does. So there's a tool uh, packed for this. Uh, it's really geared towards microservices, but you can use it uh, for the front-end, and they're really starting to invest um, in the open API spec and using this for um, front-end testing as well. Uh, so <coughs> this is kind of how contract testing works. It puts something in between your consumer and provider, so your front end and your API. And it'll basically just like cache the requests you send from your front end when you run the tests. And then when your back end runs it, it'll forward those on to your back end uh, while the test suite is running. And then it will cache the responses it gets from those and then send those back to your front end. So you kind of get this nice integration test without actually hitting your production APIs or, or testing APIs. Um, so this is really good because it means your back end can make changes and if these contracts pass, they can confidently ship. They're not going to break your front end because um, this does happen a fair bit if, if you have a lot of front ends talking to the same, same API. Um, the reason this is useful because if you can do that with end-to-end -end testing um, and test your API that way, but the more you write and the more changes you have, you kind of have this increasing workload of tests to maintain. But you just need to write one contract for each, each consumer of each endpoint. And so the more you have, you kind of just get this linear, linear effort. Um, so there are a few things you can't use contract testing for. Um, <laughs> so if you're exposing your, the same API that your front end is consuming to customers, so if you're allowing them to access an API for like a SaaS product or something, you can't use this because you don't control all the consumers of your API. So in that case, you'll need to use something like JSON schema validation and do proper versioning and deprecation if you want to make changes to your API. But if you're the only consumer um, of your API, you can definitely use these because you need to control both sides. So again, like public APIs that you don't own, you can't use this for um, because you don't control the upstream. Uh, Pass-through APIs, so if you have an endpoint, you're posting something to and it just dumps it on a queue and just returns back all good, it's not going to tell you anything because you're going to get the same response no matter what you send. Um, so this is kind of the structure of the test you write for contract testing. So you basically do this like given there is no user called Mary, if I post the users with this object, I get a 200 OK. Um, so this is the kind of thing you do. <coughs> but if you stick to the happy path, uh, you miss uh, like the case of different responses and response codes. You potentially don't have, have a robust contract. So you might want to write something like this, given there's already a user called Mary. When I try and create it, I get a 409 conflict. And so far, this is pretty good. We're covering a new behavior, a new response code. Um, but you can get on a real slippery slope with contract testing. You can start doing stuff like this, um, basically doing API validation in your front-end tests. 
Um, so we've gone past the point of contract testing here, and really these tests belong in your um, user service and validation. Your front end shouldn't really care about the validation. Your API should handle that. Your front end should just care about handling the different response codes the API gives you. Um, so one thing about people complain about with JavaScript apps is having to now handle your validation on both sides. Sometimes maybe, but I tend to just not do it. I just tend to ship it to the API and let it tell me what went wrong and just handle that. Um, so yeah, don't write these kind of tests if you're doing contract testing. Because um, this is going too far and you get a really tight coupling between your contract. Um, it makes it really hard to change anything. Uh, so that's basically all the tools that I wanted to talk about at a high level. Um, just wanted to take this opportunity to say Laravel's, uh, the Laravel community in general has been like, fundamental to my development career and progress. So it's a really good opportunity to come up and speak today. And um, yeah, everyone's doing an amazing job putting out content and packages. And um, yeah, thanks for letting me speak.